That was the best-selling Australian single in Australia in 1980 and um, split ends with I Got You. Okay, we're going to have a change of tempo uh, for the moment and um, I, that's good. I think I can hear her on the line there. Um, we're going to talk about the situation uh, in the Ukraine and, uh, and what's happening there and we have on the line today, Diana, how are you? Uh, yes, good morning, Peter. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Oh, good. Yes, very well. I am very well, thank you. But I must say that from my first waking moment, that unravelling feeling sets in. And here I am in this wonderful country, Australia, and my thoughts fly to Ukraine, and I can't help thinking about what is happening over there. It's um, it's a horrible situation. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I guess just to put some context on this, um, I guess for for people here in Perth uh, and, uh, and and locals and Australians, I guess to get an understanding of Ukraine, um, it's about a quarter of the size of Western Australia. Is is that a reasonable? Uh, um, evaluation of it. It's about 600,000 square kilometres, but uh, WA is about four correct. times that size. Yes. It's a very large country, yeah. and in Europe, it is the largest country, so considerably larger than many of the European states. Russia, of course, is the largest country, but uh, Ukraine is one of potential, of wealth, a country with a very proud history, fascinating history, and Absolutely. a country which finally got its independence again in 1991 and has worked so hard to develop the democratic principles. So it is a democratic country and um, has made so much progress since 1991. It and has, and that's, uh, that, that's progress and independence, I believe, for about 44 million people as the population of, uh, of Ukraine. That's correct. And the capital, Kiev, has about 3 million people. So it's, a, it's a bit correct. bigger than Perth and a bit smaller than Sydney or Brisbane is, is a reasonable <laughs> right. size. Now, in Australia today, it's reported there's around 35,000 people of Ukraine origin and around half of those were born in Ukraine. The 2016, sorry, the 2016 census in WA uh, recorded around 750 Ukraine, Ukraine-born people, but obviously the numbers of extend, uh, extended family uh, is, is significantly more um, who may be born here of U- U- Ukrainian parents. Um, now, Diana, could you please, I guess, tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, your background, please. <clears throat> yes, I was born in Perth, and both my parents are Ukrainian. Uh, my mother was born uh, in Kamenetsk, My father was born in uh, Ukrainian ethnic territory, but politically it was Poland. And uh, as a young girl, I always spoke Ukrainian with my mum and dad, and also went to Ukrainian school where I could learn about the history, geography, and culture of Ukraine. So this was the case with virtually all of the the children in that first generation. Well, it's a very strong very, cultural background, isn't it? I, I, yes, I, uh, yes, absolutely. And that's that's going to stay with me forever. And I've seen the huge benefits from having such a wonderful. Um, cultural upbringing, both uh, in as well as an Australian citizen, but also with the cultural heritage of Ukraine, especially when I went to Ukraine for the first time in 1977. That was still during the uh, Soviet Union period. Yes, it would have been, the, yeah. Uh, under Brezhnev. But that experience of seeing your relatives for the first time, because I have no brothers or sisters, I'm an only child, and being able to communicate with them 
so, so far away from Australia, you know, some 15,000 kilometers away from Australia, and just feeling that connection and that that wonderful warmth and the welcoming and the love from their side, it was extraordinary. And one of the highlights was actually meeting my only remaining grandparent, uh, my grandmother, whom I saw for one day in my life. That's one of the main reasons I went over um, whilst I was still studying at uni here. That would have been but a very I special day, I imagine. My, oh, goodness me, you know, <laughs> looking at that, that old lady who is my grandmother um, and just her beautiful, beautiful, sparkling blue eyes. And oh, it's, it was worth a million dollars, more than a million dollars. And she died shortly thereafter, so I was very privileged. Very oh, I'm lucky. glad. Um, I'm glad you got to, uh, to to meet her and spend time with her. And um, mm. even though it's one day, well, grandparents are very special, aren't they? That's now, right. And what what really spurred me on, I must say, was that uh, my father missed his own father by six months because my father had. Um, been taken from the family in Poland uh, to uh, go to Germany to do forced labor. Right. And he didn't have a chance to really go back then and see the family anymore. So when we got the news that Dad's dad had passed away, and that really affected Dad, Mum and I said to him, you've got to go, you've got to go, your mother is still alive, go. And he did. And then with what he had to tell me and his experiences, I was really, really spurred on, I've got to go, I've got to go. And I did. I made it. And what a blessing. Yes. Okay, um, Diana, I'd like to sort of move uh, and change gear and talk, maybe talk about the current situation and uh, I guess how close to uh, to things your relatives are over there, and um, uh, where where are your relatives in in respect to uh, to the current uh, you know Russian military forces and uh, occupation that's in Ukraine at the moment? Various in various cities in Ukraine, I have a cousin with her mother in Kiev itself. So they're in the thick of it, obviously. I, um, terrible. I have a cousin about 200 kilometers south of Kiev in Cherkasy, and the rest of my relatives are in western Ukraine, so in Lviv. Then on the way from Lviv, going westwards to the uh, Polish border, yeah. there is the town of Yavoriv, and I have an uncle and an aunt, and um, many, many first cousins, second cousins, and also in Sambir, which is very close already to the Polish border. It's about 30 kilometers from the Polish border. Yeah. And there I have um, a wonderful second cousin with family members also. We all know about uh, what's happening in uh, Kiev at the moment, but uh, I think I also saw some news footage last night and the reporter was in Lviv. You, you just mentioned your, uh, I think, a cousin there or you know, cer certainly one of your relatives. So um, they're certainly in the, uh, the, the thick of it. And um, how have you managed to be in contact with your relatives? Uh, is this by phone or email or uh, what, what sort of channel? Yes, I've been managing, not every time that I try, but I have managed to speak um, quite frequently on the phone. And uh, I've also managed to Skype, which is good. Sometimes we've been interrupted, or at least with my cousin in Kiev, by bomb explosions. Uh, but the news has been coming through. So I didn't manage to um, speak with them yesterday, but before yesterday. So uh, I caught up on their news as much as possible. And it's, it's um, very dramatic. It, uh, it sends one really into a turmoil. 
So well, you last communicated with them a couple of days ago. So that's, uh, I, I guess, that's a, a positive. Although it would be good to hear from them, them again. Um, that's right. What are they saying? What are they telling you, Diana? Well, I'll start with the situation in Western Ukraine before I then um, give you a little report about sure. um, what is happening at the Kiev end. Now, everyone thought that things were going to be quite stable in Western Ukraine. Uh, however, that hasn't proven to be the case. Now, um, a lovely cousin of mine with her family, so husband and two children, left you, uh, Lviv because they uh, could see that it, the situation was becoming um, quite unstable. So initially, um, my cousin was with her mother in Sambir, but then um, because they have very good friends in and family in Poland, um, my cousin's husband managed to get them over into Poland, so her and the two beautiful little girls. But he himself, of course, um, can expect to have to join the army. Yes. Um, uh, another, um, the other uh, child in the family, uh, so the son of my second cousin in Samzir, uh, the son with his wife and um, lovely baby boy, also have sought refuge at their mother's house. And although they're only seven kilometers from Sambir, uh, and it's still classed as being an outer suburb of Sambir, they do have military installations there that were bombed. Right. So for the security of living in a house just, just on the outskirts of um, the town would seem to be a safer place. And then you have the case of... Um, uh, uh, our family's friend who also managed to get his wife and children over the border and then very stoically just said, and for me, work starts tomorrow, which means um, signing up uh, because he has had five years of military experience and he's joining the war. My second cousin's husband, who is, uh, over 60, therefore, he would not necessarily be needed for um, on on the ground fighting, but has is doing his bit by being in part of the administration, which is organising everything it has to for um, the defence operation um, that is also being done in in yeah. review. Can I just add a little, little personal sure. touch from speaking about Lviv? Yes. You know, on the news, we see the Lviv train station so frequently, a beautiful, beautiful um, heritage building. Yes. And so many times I have arrived and departed from that station when coming to the beautiful city of Lviv to visit my relatives over the years. And for me, the station is associated with wonderful memories yeah, I and just the anticipation is. of the train pulling into the station and the smiling faces of my relatives, the joy of seeing each other again. Now, the tears come yes. because the station is associated with a mass exodus of thousands of innocent people, Ukrainians desperate to leave via Poland, and the only exit out of Ukraine towards the West. Yes, well, train, that's what I was seeing last night and the desperation yeah. of the people and uh, some, you know, not fitting on the trains and being left behind. Yeah. So that, that's so your relatives you in have, the West. How, how are your relatives in, um, uh, in, in Kiev and uh, sort of central Ukraine going? Yes. Well, um, I have had trouble contacting so more than two days ago now my cousin in the, the central part in Cherkasy. Yes. He did so, tell me during the first conversation that um, the, there was um, a missile explosion about 15 kilometers from the city. And since then, I haven't been able to actually speak with him anymore. Right. But my cousin in Kiev uh, itself, uh, there's a lot that I would like to say uh, that I have heard from her, but for her personally first. 
Uh, she is an academic who works at one of the main universities in Kiev, and her mother could not get out of Kiev in time. That's what I was going to ask. They, Are they trying to get mm-hmm. out, or uh, have they got they, any idea where they'll they, go? Uh, they would. They will keep on trying to get to Lviv by train or by some bus transport, whatever uh, might be, you know, possible, because they would then stay with my cousin in Sambir. Right. So that's the family connection there. Now, at, at present, they're spending their nights in the polyclinic hospital bunker, and it's only a five-minute walk from their apartment building, but even that short walk is risky and dangerous, fraught with danger. In fact, um, with our last conversation, we were Skyping and there was a really hefty explosion that she had to look into in case they needed to um, try and escape already. But no, she stayed put. We kept on Skyping. And I must say that in spite of all of the difficulties, even things that you know they can see from out of their apartment window, um, they both remain very focused, realistic, and fully up to date uh, with the war movements in Ukraine. And she's described some of these very, very soberly, some of which we have already seen on uh, the TV and other media reports, the various um, heavy fighting near Vasilkova, for example, or yesterday in um, um, Bucha, um, very, very heavy fighting. Um, and the the details of what she's saying to me um, uh, is 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 quite fascinating. Now, one of the things which uh, I think a lot of us probably uh, would not would possibly be surprised about, but it's part and parcel, I suppose, of the invasion um, methodology are the dramatic sabotage acts, um, particularly on the right bank of Ukraine, where soldiers, Russian soldiers, were dressed in Ukrainian uniforms. But at least in this particular case, uh, it was an example of where the planned deed was successfully foiled by the Ukrainians. And then I would like to just tell you what kind of incidents that they are living with and hearing that does affect how they think and even situations which give them a glimmer of, you might call it absurd hope, because the war is also revealing absolutely absurd situations and those involving disinformation on the part of the Tell us Russian more about forces. that, Diana. Hmm. Now, for example, and these are examples that are documented uh, so there is evidence for all of these situations. In the Sumska Oblast region, that's um, right on the eastern border with Russia, there was the case of some 5,000 Russians who were on a contractual status. And they, when they were told to go and do their deeds, they refused to fight because they said to kill people was not a condition explicitly stated in their contracts. <laughs> then, elsewhere, Russians, Russian soldiers had um, reported to their superiors, had been given orders as to where they were to go and what they were to attack. And on the way to their destination, they actually emptied the petrol in their tanks so that they couldn't continue on the road any further, stating when the Ukrainians then came up to them uh, that we, the Ukrainians said, what do you want? And uh, they said, well, we we do not want to fight you. And the Ukrainians said, well, what, do you want to lift somewhere or what? I mean, it's, you don't know whether to laugh or to cry. They get off of the return back to Russia. Well, it just shows that there are, honestly, those soldiers that do not want to be in a war with Ukrainians. And then an extraordinary case, and he's not the only one. 
uh, of a young Russian soldier, a conscript, along with the others, who were captured. And the Ukrainians gave them the opportunity to call their, their family in Russia. So this young soldier calls his father in Russia to let him know where he is. And his father could not understand how his son could possibly have become a uh, prisoner of war when his son left with the army. It was understood by both that he was being deployed for military exercises uh, somewhere, not that he ended up at war in Ukraine. So that comes as a shock to both. And there are so many cases that you hear uh, about um, captured soldiers and um, interestingly it's been revealed that if the Russian soldiers became prisoners of war they were instructed to say that they thought they were going on military exercises not to wage war in Ukraine so they have been misled um, of interest also is that uh, Mr. Putin has uh, apparently just fired 15 military generals entrusted with launching the invasion of Ukraine. So you see, these cases in a way offer that strange glimmer of hope to the people because they show that all is not well at all in the armed forces and their uh, morale. Well, it's, now, it's, another it's very, mind-boggling... Um, sorry, go on. Mm, um, another really, really important one, and um, it's, it's, it's a mind-boggling case illustrating the disinformation in Russia. Now, my cousin in Kiev, she has a Russian neighbor, and this neighbor speaks with her sister in Russia, or spoke with her uh, sister three days ago, and asked her sister in Russia angrily what the heck the Russians were doing in Kiev. But her sister in Russia apparently had no idea that Kiev was being attacked. Only the Donbass, Luhansk area, um, mm. the problematic um, areas. Because that's how it's being reported by the Russian media. So, you know, the people are being subject to these lies and this disinformation over there. And then we should never forget those brave people already in various parts of Ukraine who have simply stood in front of approaching tanks and emphatically told the Russian soldiers to stop fighting and to stop killing innocent civilians. Diana, so let's, precise, un let's yeah. unpack that a little bit at the moment um, and and that uh, that defiance. Now, I guess if we go right to the top, the Ukraine president, Vladimir Zelensky, he's refused the opportunity to evacuate Ukraine and is standing firm and is right. rallying the, the population to resist and fight back. So a lot of coverage that we, we do see in the media has has shown uh, the defiance of the, uh, the population in Ukraine and their willingness, uh, and you've described it here uh, today as well, their, their willingness to en enlist and, uh, and volunteer to fight. Now, there seems a strong determination to, to resist the, the Russian advance. And um, Diana, c can you tell me more about people um, I guess how people are feeling with this defiance in, in, in Ukraine and how they're responding to this. Yes, and this starts with the way that I am seeing a, almost a different side to my relatives and they reflect every person in Ukraine. Now, this has been a very um, important impression during my phone calls and Skype sessions and I myself, for example, am just in so much inner turmoil. You know, it's so distressing for everyone because they're surprised at the scale of this invasion. Our hearts bleed for the family, what they're describing. But I am in awe of their attitude because they do not expect one single word of pity. Instead, what impresses me and moves me to the core is their strong spirit, their courage, their sense of mission, of purpose. They may be afraid, uncertain about what will or can happen, but they are so incredibly stoic, absolutely focused, 
resilient and determined to defend what is theirs. Everyone, young and old, no ifs and buts. Ukrainians don't want this war, but they are ready to face the enemy. They will not surrender. And this is the truly transformed Ukrainian national consciousness that has united the nation. Now, one sees this stance in practice in many, many ways. And the whole country, which has never been seen to quite this extent before, I think. So just a few examples. Some of these, I suppose you would know, but nevertheless, this involves my family too. Yes, yeah. please. Men aged but, um, above 18 are signing up without hesitation to join up. Girls, women, young people are also willing to sign up for volunteer service and weapons training. No one's equipping themselves. Or you see young couples who last week were still enjoying all that life has to offer, whereas today they stand and take up arms together, prepared to defend the country and the way of life that they love. And civilians, young and not so young, as the older men in villages and small towns, they're undergoing weapons and self-defense training. Well, there, there everyone, was a report I everyone's saw yesterday. Making, uh, everyone's and... making Molotov cocktails, you know, and they're forming territorial defense mm. squadrons, organizing themselves in groups, working at night in shifts. The women are bringing the food and something to drink. They work through the night aimed at preventing sabotage acts um, by the enemy or infiltrators, as this does, you know, happen and can happen. You've got to be very wary. There, there, there is a, a, a huge, I guess, defiant movement, isn't there? Uh, Diana, how do you think the Ukraine president is uh, dealing with the situation? I think that President Zelensky is showing his mettle absolutely showing his mettle. He is standing by the people. He is doing what is absolutely possible. He won't leave the people. And as you said, Peter, he had the chance. And, you know, what did he say? I need ammunition. I don't need a ride. Mm, yes. Something which yeah. will go down as one of the most important statements in history, probably. He is keeping very, very calm and focused, like everyone else, constantly um, encouraging people to do what they can. So everyone is mobilized at the smallest level. And it's, it's an extraordinary experience, really. It certainly sounds uh, quite traumatic. Diana, to bring things a bit closer to uh, to home, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, there's a, a local Perth Ukrainian uh, community. Um, I'm imagining a lot of those people are in a similar situation to you, with relatives and, and family still in uh, in Ukraine. Um, yes. How yes. how are they dealing with the situation? Uh, I think um, well. I think that I'm speaking for uh, for everyone. Um, because so many, you know, of of our people in the community do have relatives or friends whose lives have been thrown into this horrific disarray so dramatically, um, and uh, you know, we, as I say, we weep for, we all weep for, and with the Ukrainians, in our heart and soul, there is no distance at all separating us. Um, and we are doing also what we can to keep the um, the flag flying, the information flowing. So I must say, just from this point of view, uh, I'm just so, so grateful that I can be on air because I think I do speak with gratitude on behalf of our entire community in Perth in having this opportunity to at least share things True life moments from what um, what we're all experiencing via the Ukrainian situation. We are doing a lot um, also to um, try and um, keep the spirit up. This is 
um, very, very important also um, for our relatives. Those who have spoken with the relatives also say the same as I have been saying, that our relatives in Ukraine also, one of the most important things for them is to feel the moral and spiritual support of Ukrainians in the diaspora. Um, and whatever we're doing in Perth here, um, we tell it to our families over there to vote for their parents. Now, for example, um, um, on Sunday, um, we had a special mass and prayers for Ukraine at the uh, Catholic Church, which was also attended by the Catholic Archbishop of Uruguay, Timothy Costello. Right. And the service was followed by a group, a performance um, by a group of our indigenous Australians and a group of New Zealand Maoris performing traditional dances to express their support, their empathy, and in these dances, they were symbolically transmitting energy and a strong positive spirit to us. That's, this was amazing. That's awesome. Um, it, was, it was so moving for our community um, to know that these and other groups feel what we're going through emotionally, and they want to support us in their traditional way. I mean, it's incredible. They don't know us. We don't know them. And yet there we were sharing hugs and just feeling that they feel what we are going through. Now, when I have managed to slip this information through to my relatives, do you know how wonderful that made them felt? That, that must and, make them you know, feel, I, uh, I guess, a little bit of comfort, if, if, if nothing else. And Diana, you've already sort of moved me where, where I was uh, going, to, uh, going to, to, to go and ask you, um, what can we do from over here? How, how can we support Ukrainian people mm. here in Perth, mm. as well mm -hmm. as show our support for Ukraine mm. uh, overall? What would you suggest? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I can I can uh, just maybe give you or once again express a few things. Um, I did also want to mention uh, it. Was, I mentioned our Ukrainian Catholic Church. In all fairness, I must say what a fantastic special prayer service there was at the Ukrainian. Um, Orthodox Church on Saturday morning when the press came and there was um, a, a rally around the church where even certain Russian ladies came with their Ukrainian flags in support of the cause. So our churches are doing so much and this is being communicated to uh, our relatives. Now in Perth, a wonderful thing which um, Perth has done which is good for us and lovely to communicate to our families. Um, and I'm going to tell this to them as soon as possible, that Perth has gone yellow and blue, uh, which are the colours of the Ukrainian yes. flag, yes. in solidarity with Ukraine in key locations, such as the Optus Stadium, the city of Perth, the council photos, the RSC arena, terrace lighting, the WA police, HQ building, development key, um, rather um, in Eliz on Elizabeth Key, that's another one. So when, when people, if you could take photos when you see them, post them on social media, help get this message through to Ukraine and internationally. Now, of course, what Ukrainians, um, oh, also I, I must mention, many, many people are asking me, what else can we do? Can we donate some, somewhere? What can we do? Now, this is an important message because the National Bank of Ukraine, the NBU, has just opened up a special multi-currency account to raise funds for Ukraine's armed forces. And should anyone want to make a donation, um, to find the website and therefore link, all you have to do is just type in the words 
NBU opens special account to raise funds for Ukraine's armed forces. And Caritas also has an emergency okay. uh, appeal going. Donate to Caritas, Ukraine crisis appeal. And I can only say that every single dollar helps. Sanctions won't deter Mr. Putin completely. So obviously, and there's no way around this, what Ukrainians do need is the ammunition to continue the fight to defend their land, their territory, families, homes, to preserve what is rightfully theirs. Yes. And I can only reiterate that wonderful statement by Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky, the fight is here and we need ammunition not a ride. Well, that, that so, really I mean, sums up how he thinks the rest of the world needs to be responding and, uh, and, and, and well, what we can do. From what I understand, countries uh, have increased, they've noticed this and how important it is um, to help Ukraine in the situation. Uh, and they are responding with equipment needs. It's It started to go in this direction, and that is a good thing. Yes. This is a situation of David against Goliath. They are doing what they have to do for the sake of their independent nation, um, but they do not have the, um, the hardware like the enemy does. Yes. So yes. whatever we can do, um, I think, is, is something which simply has to be done. Yes, yeah. Oh, goodness, yes. So it's, I, uh, because because also, one we really shouldn't forget that, okay, it's not just a problem um, against Ukraine, um, because details, you know, are emerging that this can have an enormous implication internationally and also other consequences, um, uh, you know, even in Russia and for the Russian people. I mean... Mr. Putin should not be allowed to succeed. If he were to succeed with Ukraine, he would not stop at Ukraine's borders. Yes, he's, yes. He's always very bitterly regretted the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And it is, it is his mission to take back territory that was separated um, from Soviet times. For example, the Baltic states and in particular Ukraine. So he wants to start by attempting to crush the free will of the Ukrainian people. So, you know, strangely in the realm of political values, Ukraine is not Russia's cousin, it's Russia's competitor. You know, a strong dictatorial state versus the flourishing democratic neighbor. Yes, yes. And when we speak about democracy and democratic principles, you know, what it means with the rights of people in the country, how you treat your um, citizens. Uh, the Ukrainians, they have their very strong faith, they have their principles, um, their relatively new democracy, which is... Um, a jewel, the most beautiful thing that a country can have. And then you see by the actions of the other side, uh, which is a completely different approach. Now, let me give you a very concrete example. It's a very heart-rending example. Now, Mr. Putin made a speech on the 24th of February 2022, in which he justifies the invasion of Ukraine. And one of the things which he states, and this is the official translation, says, what is today happening does not come out of a desire to infringe on the interests of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Our plans do not include the occupation of Ukrainian territories we are not going to impose anything on anyone by force. 
So he states these assurances and promptly does the opposite. Yes, the actions so don't the, match the deeds, do they? Well, no. And I'd like to quote um, quite a heartbreaking email message that was sent to a, a lovely friend of mine in Perth by her sister from Kiev on the 27th of February. I won't mention her name um, to whom the email is addressed. Thank you. Dear little sister, thank you, Ukrainian diaspora in Australia, to everyone who supports us and our dear Ukraine in today's trials. Today, the 27th of February, 2022, fierce fighting took place in Kiev, Bucha, Irpin, Vasilkiv, Chernihiv, and other cities of Ukraine. They bombed the Okhmadiv, which is the children's hospital. Sick children and cancer patients were transferred to the basement to be saved from death. They fired on the houses of civilians, shot two families with tiny children who were traveling, um, evacuated from Kiev. This is how you have to be inhuman to do this. For what? I can't anymore. Tears fill my eyes. My head hurts. I'm sorry to cut a flower into a bouquet. I apologize to her before cutting. And then the creatures killed the baby and mum with dad and grandparents. Mum and dad and grandparents. God, won't you take revenge on them? I ask you, if possible, to close the sky over Ukraine. We will be bombed again. Mr. Putin instructed to bomb civilians. In any case, thank you all very much. Dear sister, we will definitely win. Many, many kisses. Greetings from all of us. There are many of us, and we cannot be defeated. Bless you and her sister's name. Now, what do you make of that? That's, um, uh, that's, a, that's, a, very powerful, uh, that's a very powerful piece. And, um, you know, you've painted today for us, Diana, uh, and we thank you for that. You've painted us a, a very graphic picture of, uh, of, of what's happening uh, in Ukraine now, and it's, uh, it, it's shocking and devastating. Um, you know, the impact that we see on the Ukrainian population is, is, is massive and it's tragic. And you also said from a global perspective, it's, uh, you know, it's sending, uh, I guess, destabilising shockwaves around the world. So I, I, I guess to, to sort of close things out today, uh, I, I guess um, I hope your, your relatives stay safe and away from physical danger and if they can, uh, they can manage to, uh, to, to evacuate to, to, uh, to a safer place. Um, that's you know, well. They don't that's necessarily we want to. Not all of them. They they want to stay where they belong. As they say, we belong here. We don't belong elsewhere. But yeah. one never knows what can happen. Um, Peter, I would like to just mention a couple of other things which I think are important. Sure. Um, because we have to be, we have to have to understand the both sides of humanity in 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 this case. Now, and I think it's important for people to hear this. You see, President Putin, with his belligerent acts, is not only trying to destroy Ukraine, but in the process, he's also destroying his own country. You know, courageous mm. Russian citizens are protesting in Russia against the war. They're being arrested by the thousands simply for speaking out against war. With an, and then with the increasing number of casualties and body bags or ashes being delivered now to loved ones already, these protests will no doubt also increase and become more vocal. The Russian people must also receive truthful information about what their president has unleashed on Ukraine by the Russian army. And that there are obviously many Russians who do not want to fight with the Ukrainians and have seen on Ukrainian soil that there is no reason to fight. They are not being attacked by Ukraine, as the prisoners of war yes. or those who have surrendered have you know, admitted. So for what have their loved ones died? And it's not for the benefit of the Russian people, but only for Mr. Putin's 
territorial interest. It's a futile. Now, in summary, please do allow me a couple of more minutes. The spirit of the peace-loving, welcoming, hard-working Ukrainian people is indefatigable. Soldiers and citizens, as you know, are putting into practice quite literally the words of their national anthem, which states, we will lay down our souls and our bodies for our freedom, and we will show to all that we are a people of the true Cossack nation with our pride and fighting spirit to defend what is rightly ours. And we ask the Australian government to stand strongly by Ukraine to assist this unjustly besieged country in every way possible to help the Ukrainian army repel the enemy and defend their hard-won and legitimate independence and to show compassion in the case of potential Ukrainian refugees where possibly um, we over here in this beautiful land of Australia may be in a position of needing to take in our relatives in their greatest time of need. And Peter, thank you for giving me this time. And we, Ukrainians in Australia and in the diaspora, ask you that you pray for Ukraine, for peace, that a democratic Ukraine may again be restabilized to prosper, become stronger, and even more beautiful than before. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Diana. It has been wonderful talking with you. Uh, you know, it, it, it has been a, an extended discussion, but it's been, it's been uh, incredibly value valuable. Uh, look, we trust that the uh, the metal of the people stays strong in Ukraine and um, we, we, we pray that this situation uh, with that strength uh, won't last long and, um, and, and has a positive resolution. Um, Diana, thank you for talking with us today at, uh, at IPL Radio and um, I think we've, uh, we'll move on to a, a little bit of music that's, that's quite, uh, quite pertinent. Thank you very much. Thank You've you. been listening to uh, Diana, part of the um, part of the Ukrainian uh, community here in Perth, uh, with some very very graphic descriptions of uh, of what life is like over there at the moment, and um, some of it's quite horrifying, isn't it? And uh, it's it's shocking, and this is reverberating around the world. Our thoughts are with them. Let's imagine. <laughs>